Let the water and the blood from thy riven side which flowed be a sin, the double cure. Cleanse me from its guilt and power. Not the labors of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands. Could my zeal no respite know? Could my tears forever flow? All for sin could not atone. Thou must save, and thou alone. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly, wash me, Savior, or I die. While I draw this fleeting breath, when mine eyes close in death, when I soar to worlds unknown, see thee on thy judgment throne, rock of ages cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 26. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us bow our heads. Our dearest Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your love. We thank you for your compassion. Indeed, we thank you for the gift of life and for your stubbornness in wishing to give us that gift of life in spite of our shortcomings. We thank you for the opportunity to be seen through the righteousness of Jesus Christ and not our own sins and shortcomings if we accept what he did and seek to serve him. We pray, Lord, that you will bless this bread, which represents his body, which was broken for us. We pray this in the name of Lord Jesus. It will be done. Amen.
celebrate what our Savior did for us on that cross. And Lord, we also thank God, we thank you for your son's blood, which was shed, his life's blood, which was shed so that we might live. We're mindful, Lord, that he did this before we were his friends, while we were yet his enemies. We thank you, Lord, that he prayed, even for those who are crucifying, that that sin should not be held against them. We thank you for his great love and his willingness to pay such a price for our sin and so that we might live. We pray that you will bless this cup, which for us is his shed blood. We pray this in the name of Lord Jesus. May it will be done. Amen. At this time, we offer all of us an opportunity to partake of God's great character trait of, of giving. He gave so much for us, and now we have the opportunity to return a portion of his gifts back to, to, to him. And we have an opportunity to partake in, in his ministry of financing the spreading of his gospel. Let us bow our heads. Oh, and the... There are baskets in the back of the church provided for that purpose. Let us bow our heads. Our dearest Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for all the wonderful gifts which you have given. Everything good in our lives comes from you. And we pray especially for that supreme, thanks for that supreme gift which you gave your Son, Jesus Christ, that we might have eternal life with you in heaven. And we pray, Lord, that you honor, thanks that you honored us by allowing us to participate in that divine 
uh, in that divine quality of giving and sharing the gospel. We pray, Lord, that you'll bless both the gift and the giver. We pray this in the name of the Lord Jesus. It will be done. Amen. Can you give it a blessing and sing a song of great blessing? We'll sing page 286 from the last verse. Remain standing for the scripture reading. Let's sing. Wonderful story of love. Tell it to me again. Wonderful story of love. When you Our scripture reading this morning will be John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God, not, God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the, that, that the world through him might be saved. You may be seated. Good morning. That was close. Let's try again. Good morning. There you are. It is good to see you. For those uh, who had a rough 2020 and uh, who are getting over all of the pandemic and all of that, we are glad uh, to see you once again. And let me extend, extend the warmest uh, welcome that has already been extended. We are grateful to have you. We like to see our seats uh, getting back to where they once were. We are so grateful that you have decided to be with us here today. I turned on the television this morning, and I guess I expected to see the Gonzaga score. Did y'all watch that last night? That was a long game. I thought, why am I watching this game? That's not what I saw. What I saw on the History Channel and on the Discovery Channel and, and that group of channels was a two-hour documentary on Roman crucifixions. And I said, oh yeah, today's Easter. Now, I forgot about Easter because before the girls left, uh, I gave them some candy and those kinds of things and sent them on their way. And so I didn't have a basket of candy waiting on me to remind me that it was Easter. But as you and I look at this day, like so many others around the world, we think about that crucifixion, and that's a good thought to have. But today, instead of looking at the actual events of the crucifixion, I want us to notice why. Why all these things happen. And it's found in probably the most familiar verse in the entire Bible. John chapter 3 and verse 16 and 17. No other verse really is held in such high regard. 
we all mostly probably can recite it, or at least uh, the crux of that verse. We've seen that verse in photos and in, in cross-stitching. If you watch the NFL at all since the 70s, you've seen at least signs of it in the end zone. You see those plaques and those kinds of things in our home. That is a very familiar verse to us. And God so lo- or for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And as these words pass across the lips of Jesus the Christ, the Jews who are around him are, are consumed with tradition. It's mostly the Pharisees who are around him. They're consumed with what has been going on and and how it has been going on. And so they're consumed with what is in their world right now. The Greeks, as, as they stand around him, are looking for the perfect man, the perfect idol. If you can work your physique to the perfect shape, if you can think the perfect way, then you are the best Greek you possibly can be. The Romans are, are simply obsessed with power, and they don't really care what this guy from Nazareth is saying. And realistically, as you and I look back 2,000 years on it, neither separately nor combined can any of these groups solve the problem that is mentioned in John chapter 3 and verse number 16. And that problem is not race-wide. That problem is humanity-wide. The problem that's being addressed here is sin. See, the Jews here, as they're standing around, believe that the blood of bulls and goats will, will absolute and will wash away sin. That's not necessarily the case. See, according to Hebrews chapter number 10, verses 1 and 2, in the Old Testament, those sins were simply pushed forward to the next Yom Kippur, or Day of Atonement, where the Israelite nation would face them once again, and they would be pushed further again. Even the greatest thinkers of the Greeks, as they would stand around Jesus, would have no answer for sin. They they wouldn't have... No way to derive a plan that is mentioned in John chapter 3 and verse number 16 as being anywhere uh, attainable for sin to be washed away. The Romans, once again, really didn't care as they stand around being the superpower. What they think is we can push this nation of people and their sinful ways out of our way because obviously our way is right. No amount of uh, military might that they had or power that they had would do anything for sin. It's the fact then that man could not, and it's the fact now that man cannot do away with sin. And it would take an act of God. It would take God sacrificing himself on a cross. So as you and I look at John 3.16, as we look at it as being the greatest verse, I want us to break those words down and look at the great things that you find within that verse. Number one, John 3.16 has the greatest being mentioned in that verse. At the very beginning, you'll read, For God, for God so loved the world. In in Genesis chapter 2 and 1, even in 3, 4, 5, 6, all the way through the book of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, all the way through the book of Revelation. You see this one who is the greatest being that we have ever known, the one who is the creator who is mentioned throughout the Old and the New Testament as being the creator, the sustainer of life, the creator. What an interesting idea. This is the one who by the sound, now listen, by the sound of his voice creates everything that we know and have. All those things that you and I can see, all those things that you and I cannot see, all of those systems within our body, within our uh, world, within our universe, all created by Jesus say, or by God saying, let there. What an interesting idea. In Acts chapter uh, 17, verse number 28, he is mentioned as being our being, the reason why we have life. He is the sustainer of us. And in Psalm chapter 23, as, that, as David would begin to write that psalm, he would write, the Lord is my shepherd. 
I shall not want. He goes on through those six verses to tell us all of the things that are provided to us by God, how his protection is given to us, and how he loves us so much. For God. You see, man thinks he can uh, get away with or, or move around or sidestep sin. It's just not possible. And God proves time and time and time again that it is his way that redeems man. You look back over the world powers that were throughout history, and maybe we ask the question, where are the Egyptians? And I laughingly said to myself this morning in the 730 Hour. Where are the Egyptians? Well, they're in Egypt. Well, they are. Where are they on the global scale as a world power? Non-existent. What about the Babylonian kingdom? Where is it? Or the Greeks or the Romans? And it was during those times that God was preparing man for the establishment of the church. And in the day of Rome, the church was established. And the church still exists in every single country in the world. The rest of these superpowers have gone by the wayside. Why? Because the greatest being established his kingdom. As a matter of fact, four times in the book of Daniel, you'll read the Most High ruleth in the kingdoms of God, thus proving further to us that God places men and women in power that he wants to have in power. Notice this next greatest, the greatest action for God. So love. Love is an interesting thing. Songs are written about it. Poems are written about it. People will tell you that they fall in or out of love. And it's such an intangible, fluid word uh, that you and I don't know how to define it correctly. Let's do that for those on, on the other side. Water bottle. What do you think of? Are you thinking about this one? We can see those things in our minds. They're tangible. Songbook, we, we know those things. Clocks, we see those things. Love, faith, anger. Those are, those are so hard for us to express adequately, and yet Jesus the Christ, or, or Paul rather, through the inspiration of God, writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and verse number 13, out of all these things that love is the greatest, out of, uh, out of all these things. And, and as you and I look at that, we say, how is that the greatest? How out of faith and, and hope and love is, is love the greatest? They're all intangible. Well, as we look at this, we'll look at this adverb of manner, the word so. It's not that God loved us. And, and the verse could adequately read, for God loved the world. And, and that would put out the, the amount. But here we have an adverb of manner. He loves the world to, to such a great extent that he's willing to do this and that. We could spend the rest of our lives gathering every day in, in, in places like this. And we could spend the rest of our lives to try to fully comprehend and to fully digest every little nook and cranny of the love that God has for us. And realistically, as we pass from this life into eternity, we would only have looked at the surface. And even as you and I look at John chapter 3 and verse 16, and we see, for God so loved, we, uh, as much as we dissect these words, we, we only see the surface. Because the love of God is incomprehensible to us. Why would he love us that much? Why would he do these things? Well, let's go on and look at the next great. There's a great object here. For God so loved the world. All of us. 
The goodest and the baddest, right? The best and the worst that humanity has to offer. God loved all of them. I have a distinctive joy, much as most men do when you have an opportunity to give and to provide for your family. That, that really fits a need inside us men, and, and we enjoy those things. And if I have things that the girls would need, and I can provide those things that the girls would need, then I try to do those things that the girls need. Did you hear the constant word there? There's a difference between need and want, huh? Shake your head this way. Yeah. But as they need those things, we provide those things for them. It makes us feel good. It makes us stand up a little taller, doesn't it? Now, would I provide those things for men and women I knew were going to murder me? Or steal from me or abuse me? What about just people who hate me in general? You know, I'd be less likely to do that. I may stand here alone by myself and you say, no, I would do it. I'd be less likely to do that. How about you? In Romans chapter 5, verse 8 and 9, you and I read that God gave for us in that while we were wonderful and would follow after him and were following what he said, he wanted to give us something special because of our love for him. Well, in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, what you'll read were, were, or is, in that while we were still or while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Let's take that a little further. In that while I was still the enemy of the state of the kingdom of God, Christ still died for me. In that I was still a terror sail toward God's kingdom, Christ still died for me. While I was living a rogue life, while I was living outside of the boundaries, God's greatest object is humanity. For God so loved the world that even when they were opposed to him, he sent Jesus the Christ. Now notice this. Here's the greatest gift. For God so loved the world that he gave. I have a couple of rings in a drawer at my house. One of them is a ring from the I guess late 40s. It was a championship football ring. No. Just to answer your questions, I did not play football. I know how you're looking at me and say, that's a gigantic fellow. He probably played football. I did not. I did have a gigantic grandfather who did play football. And he won a ring for that. Graduating high school in the late 40s. And I have a class ring of his. Now, in material, those rings are probably, at the best, worth five, six bucks, maybe. But they're valuable to me. I don't wear them. I don't really get them out and look at them. But when I open that drawer and I see them, I think of a grandfather I had oh, about 30 years ago. Most of the gifts that we have are special to us because of the people who gave them to us. I have a paper tie on my tie rack at the house. And I don't remember if Emma or Chloe gave it to me, but it's about this long, so you can't really wear it. And it's, uh, I don't know, a decade old. And it doesn't, imagine this, it doesn't match any of the suits I have. I think that's a stretch. I could probably match anything. I don't throw it away because it's valuable to me. Why? Because they gave it to me. Take that idea and look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 7, or 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse number 5, and you'll see the value of what was given to us at the cross. Yes, because of the one who was on that cross and because of what that gift means to us, but notice the giver of that gift. That one that we started with, for God, remember that? For God so loved the world that he gave. God saw some sort of value in me to give me something. And he gave me a gift. 
the greatest gift ever given to man in the history of men is the salvation from his sin. Is Jesus on that cross. As we continue to look, we see the greatest sacrifice for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. As you and I look through those pages and those terms in the King James that would say things like only begotten, uh, what we notice there is the word begotten means that um, this is a, an offspring of mine, whether it be a child or a grandchild or even a great-grandchild. The word translated only begotten is translated from a Greek word called monogenes, and it may be the most difficult word in the entire Bible to translate because the, the, the phrase only begotten doesn't do it enough justice. Neither does the phrase completely unique. That is uh, completely different from any other person in human history. The 1.5 gallons of blood that are found within his body were not found anywhere else and no other blood other than that amount will be able to redeem man. And it's still not good enough. The definition still not good enough. The only begotten. Maybe, maybe that's where we should start with the word the. The one and only to the exclusion of all others. The only begotten Son. We read in Acts chapter 8 and verse number 37 where the Ethiopian eunuch would say to, to Philip, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I don't have sons. And I have daughters and I have a wife. And I might be willing to give up my life for a cause that I believe greatly in. But I'm going to be real honest with you when I say this. I'm not willing to give up my girls. You have God who is willing to give up his only son. Who is completely unique to everyone else. Who wears the cloak of humanity. In order to save me, in order to save you. You didn't know you were that valuable, huh? He'd give everything for you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him. Faith is hard to put into words, and faith can be put in too many different things. Sometimes we put our, our faith in men, and, and every time we do that, men tend to destroy it. Here's some homework for you this week. Go and flip through your Bible, and possibly with the exception of where you, where you wrote your name at the beginning, find your name in the Word of God. And what you'll do is you'll realize that it's not there and that it's throughout at the same time. You say, how is that possible? Well, your name, your given birth name, your nickname, your whatever name won't be found there. But humanity, all of humanity's name will be found in the word whosoever. That encapsulates you. Me and everyone that we run into, whosoever believeth in him. I'd like for you to take a second and look at the word believeth with the E-T-H. And you say, I know where that's from. That's King James. It just, it's that old word that means believe, right? No. This word, especially the E-T-H there on the end, holds such a distinctive value from the words that end with S that it was necessary during the time that they wrote, they translated that particular copy to include it. It, it means more than just believes. It means one who is in a continual process of 
of believing. And so faith in Jesus as the Christ leads me to uh, repentance. It leads me to confession and it leads me into the baptistry. Those are necessary. After that, it leads me to a life of faithfulness. As a matter of fact, in Mark chapter 16, beginning in verse number 16, he would say this, He that believeth, E-T-H, and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth, E-T-H, not will be condemned. And so as you and I look at the greatest in in John chapter 3 and verse 16, we have to look at the greatest faith because that greatest faith is the one that continues to follow after Christ. Now notice this. Here's the greatest loss. That he that believeth should not perish. Now, to see the loss on that, you're going to have to turn that coin over. You and I can understand loss as we uh, know or maybe have experienced the loss of a home burning down. Or having a vehicle taken from us. Or how many of you have ever done this? Where's my cell phone? Oh, yeah. We lose our cell phone all the time. This is a common statement at our house. Call my phone, see where it is. Do y'all do that? We understand the loss of health. We understand the loss of a family member, even uh, that one day we will find ourselves as the one being mourned over. And all of those losses um, and those traumatic events in our lives tend to make us think very soberly of our lives. But I want you to listen to this statement and understand what I'm saying to you. If I lose heaven, I've lost everything. If I hear him say to me, depart from me, I never knew you. What a tragic day that will be there are a lot of things I want to hear him say there are a lot of questions I think on this side of eternity I I want to ask him and I don't know if I'll ever get to but there's a lot of things I'd like to hear but if I hear depart from me I'm going to be in that group that's perishing and it will be at that moment And unfortunately, it will be too late at that moment to where I understand and realize the greatest loss. There is a great blessing, though, found in the latter portion of this particular verse that they should not perish but have everlasting life. Once again, we could take the rest of our time meeting every day here in this place. And we could look at all of the verses and understand or, or attempt to understand fully the, the eternality of heaven, uh, the eternality of, of what that means and, and all of those things that would comprise heaven. I had an instructor one time say, and when we get there, we'll want to find John who wrote the book and beat him up. Because it'll not look anything like what we think. As John uses human physical words to, die, to try and describe an eternal spiritual place. It'll be so far superior to the things you and I can read and have had uh, revealed to us by the very word of God. Listen one more time to the words of Jesus the Christ. John chapter 14, beginning in verse number 1. As he's speaking to his disciples just a few days before the arrest, the trial, and the crucifixion. He would say, let not your hearts be troubled. Since you believe in God, believe also in me. Now notice this. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. How about that? I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, receive you unto myself. Now right here, that where I am, you may be also. Pearls and gold and all of those things aside, 
Notice what Jesus promises in John 14. You can live in the same place I live forever. What a blessing that would be. What a fantastic idea that would be. I can have what Jesus has? Yes, but... Friends, salvation is free, as the old tract would tell us, but it ain't cheap. It's going to cost you something. There's a man from back home whose name was Franklin Camp. He has long since passed from this life into eternity. And as you read some of his writings or listen to some of his, his cassette tapes, I know y'all don't know what that means. Uh, he makes some comments about John 3.16. Notice what he says. In the beginning of this verse, there is God for God. And at the end of the verse, there's man. And right in the middle is where we see Jesus the Christ. In this last statement, I want you to digest fully. There is no way to God for man without Christ. There's no way to God for man without Christ. On the one hand, you have deity. On the other hand, you have humanity. And right between us is a bridge. The man, Christ Jesus. The one who died on that cross. The one who was the salvation of us sent by God to redeem us back to Him for one singular purpose, and that is to restore the relationship from the garden back to where it was. And as I look around, I see men and women who have obeyed the gospel. I see some who have not. Let me encourage you to take full advantage today of the greatest salvation by the greatest God to humanity that has ever been given. Let me encourage you to hear what he has to say and believe it. Repent of your sin and confess that Jesus is the Christ. Be baptized, added to the family of God. And for you who have, as we stand to sing this song here momentarily, I want you in your mind's eye to look Jesus in the eye on that cross and see what your sin has done and my sin. And if you need to come home, now's the time to do it to a God who loves you and to a family who misses you. Come while we stand and sing for your encouragement. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you for evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power in the blood when you're working hard.
What a great service this has been. And it is so encouraging. It's so awesome to see the pews filling back up. It's good to have the family back together again. And Lord willing, as COVID slowly comes under control, we will get back to normal here shortly. If you haven't picked up a bulletin, I would encourage you to do so. We have a number uh, on our prayer list, we want to especially remember um, Kay Crossland, her family, and Kay's passing this past week. Also, Dina Wonderland's friend, Terry Mangrum, um, passed away this past Tuesday. Also, Jennifer Pogue's mother was at L2L in Dallas with our kids, and she fell and broke her hip. So they're <clears throat> dealing with all the logistics of getting her back home. Um, She'll be in Dallas for a few more days post-surgery and whatnot, so remember them. Um, parents and teens, Billy will want to meet with you tonight after services in room 118 over here, if you remember that, and we'll remind you again tonight. Also, um, as you look through your bulletin, just look for those that need some encouraging, cards, phone calls, keep them in your prayers if you would, and all of our last leader group, that there's 50 or 60 of them down there that will be traveling back from Dallas today. Keep them in your prayers as well. Anything I'm not? This is Mr. Prayer. Our God and our Father, we humbly bow before you, Lord, so thankful for the opportunity to come together as your children, as a family, to worship you, to praise you, to offer up our sacrifice, and to remember the sacrifice that you gave on our behalf and the hope of eternal life that we have. Lord, we're, we pray that we would always be mindful of the magnitude of the love that you have for us, for the finality of the gift that you gave in your Son, and the eternal hope of salvation that his blood has provided for us. Lord, we pray that we'd always carry these thoughts with us as we live our lives amongst a world that has rejected you and that so desperately needs you, needs your word, needs your love. Lord, give us the wisdom to discern your word and the courage to spread it to those that we come in contact with. And we pray, Lord, that as we leave here, that you would guide our lives, that you would give us the strength to live according to your word, and that you would forgive us when we fail in that. And in Christ your son's name we pray. Amen. <laughs>